Hey everybody, I'm Holly, aka the Scientology Geek, and I want to welcome you all to, I know this is in the data series playlist, but we're not actually reading the data series today. I am here with Mr. Dylan Gill, and instead of me trying to convey your life story, I guess why don't you give a little introduction about yourself? Um, hello, and I was raised uh, in Scientology. My grand grandfather was in it my uncle father aunt um well in it we in northern california i was sent to the sea org when i was 14 i got out when i was around 21 22 and um i don't know i got declared i got shunned you know the whole whole story and there you go. Have a, <laughs> rest is history. <laughs> All right. So I've seen some of your previous podcasts that you've done. So I know that you have worked in the Church of Spiritual Technology, CST. Um, Correct. Yeah. And you told me that you worked in CMO. So that's what I thought we would talk about today was how, what exactly was done in the Commodore's Messengers when it wasn't like Janice Grady on the ship with L. Ron Hubbard. What was it like? being on dry land and and being part of cmo well that history um they you know the way they acquired the flag land base and all that stuff has been pretty well documented um there was a few big incidents in the church uh from i guess my timeline of when i was born until now um that happened one of them was what was called the mission holders conference um, and that was in the early 80s. And that's kind of when um, DM was taking over and and they were basically, the mission holders were making too much money. So they wanted to make it kind of in-house. And um, so around, before that, they had already acquired Flag um, and LRH was off the lines with the brokers um, at um, Creston. And um, the messengers, when they when they did the international restructure um, after like the Gary Woolersham case, they um, created the Commodore's messenger org in a way that was basically like an observation and execution arm for the Watchdog Committee and for CMO International. So, and CMO stands for Commodore's Messenger Organization. Just there you go. So I don't know if that answered you. No, that 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 answered it. Um, but no, what I was wondering is, you would think that from somebody who isn't familiar with the whole missions debacle, um, but who knows what a mission is, it's like you would think that they'd be making some money. Yeah, but it, you wouldn't think it'd be too much considering that all missions do is provide like basic services and auditing. Wouldn't they then recommend somebody to the class fives? Well, that's the way the whole thing was set up. At the time, it was class four orgs, um, and they only delivered certain services. And then they switched it to um, like bigger or it's almost like set up like a um, management system where it's like you have your employees, you have your managers, your district managers, and then you have your you know top of the line. That's how they set up um, kind of the the mission network and the org network. Um, was that the missions were like introductory. They were like, um, kind of like give people a card, give them a self-analysis course. The basics, uh, the first inclination of the basics were brought up that way um, to just introductory, like $50 courses, get them in the door, get them saying, you know, they need help and, you know, get them an OCA, blah, blah, blah. Um, then the orgs were more like student hat, um, bigger courses, like more advanced courses, auditing training, um, mostly missions only um, delivered Dianetics auditing for the most part, where orgs um, delivered more Scientology auditing. So less introductory, more kind of advanced. And then from there you went to higher orgs and then you went to flag or you went to, um, the AO or ASHO or or anything like that, St. Hill, etc. Okay. So the messenger org was there basically to be 
um, this was prior, all the, the team was set up prior to um, RTC being established or any of the reorg. Um, and the reason why they did the reorg was the whole umbrella of the church was under the um, Corporation Church of Scientology California. Um, and that's when I was a kid. I was in the San Francisco org when I was a little kid. So I was part of the protests for against Larry Wollersheim, et cetera. Um, but when they reorganized, the way they reorganized was basically so each entity had its own um, like able wise um, SMI Scientology Scientology Missions International um, all had their own umbrella. So if somebody went after Narconon, they could only get Narconon. They couldn't take down the whole church, and that's kind of how they set it up. So CMO was like a watchdog for the watchdog committee. <laughs> so they were on the ground um observing uh and reporting what was going on statistics wise and all that kind of crap and i think that's where the data series kind of comes in so when did you first so let's let's go back to your days when you were when you were first in the cr when you first started on cml how did you find out you were going to be part of the commodore's messenger org I found out, so I was recruited by a mission that they used to send out missions to all the orgs and missions. <laughs> they, they'd send out missionaries, basically. And um, some of them were recruiting missions, some of them were sit handling missions, some of them were observation missions. Um, so they sent out a recruitment mission to man up different areas. So they would come around to the org probably two to three times a year and you would get kind of either recruited and they wanted you to sign a contract. Um, a lot of us kids that were younger, you know, if we were gung ho, we'd sign contracts, but they weren't legit because we weren't old enough, you know, so it wasn't a binding contract. Um, and then some of us would get serious and, and sign them and then we wouldn't be, um, legally ready to go basically so we'd be put on what's called like a project prepare and that would be like okay it's kind of a way of like like lying about your statistics <laughs> or your job like I got this product but really they're not going to report for another year because they have to do x y and z so um, I got recruited by a flag mission to Florida and I got recruited by one of the lower orgs because that's where the mission was fired out of. And um, when I so when I got to Florida, I was supposed to be in flag crew. That's what I got recru recruited for. Um, but the way the system works is they're really starved for qualified people, like their qualifications. So when you find somebody that's a new recruit and you fill out all the battery of tests and you do the life history and your sec checking and whatnot, that word kind of gets out. So when you're in the estates project force, um, you'll have recruiters from the higher up orgs coming and looking, kind of looking at you and then trading you for people that they have to bust down um, or that kind of thing. So it's it's sort of a, um, I don't know. It's the the personnel in the Sea Org is pretty crazy. Like it's 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 the way they have quals and you have to have you know all these qualifications to be in certain areas and whatnot. So, so when sounds, I got to Florida, it was like that. It kind of sounds similar to like scouting for for baseball or any kind of sport. To be honest, it does except for like it's more reactionary than like they actually do their homework and this is more like oh my god what's that in front of me i need it okay we're gonna bust this guy down so put him in this org and then we'll take this other and then we'll get this guy and it's like you don't even know it you're just a commodity and um when i think when you get to those higher up orgs you know it's more about getting like you're getting close so it's, it's more it's like Wizard of Oz kind of you're getting close to Oz and so you have to be kind of vetted in a way that you'll you're kind of like a team player by that time that's more what it is now is there any way you can describe that vetting process um it 
varies individually. Like based, I think the basic quals, like the basic qualifications, are um, for any Scientology org, Sea Org org, are pretty much level until it comes to the um, Hubbard Communications Office Division One and Division Seven, um, and then. Some of the other ones have some specific qualifications like um, finance. You know, you can't have had a lot of financial irregularities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the Hubbard Communications Office or HCO Division One, you have to have like pretty stellar quals. Like you, you have to be pretty pure. Um, you have to have a certain IQ. You have to have a certain aptitude. Your OCA, which is the Oxford Capacity Analysis Test, has to be all above a certain line. Um, your life history has to be clean. Um, no drug revert. No alcohol revert. Um, that means like you did something and then did, like went back to it kind of thing. Um, you also have to have sec checks, you know, and that's specific for every org. Like to get into a certain org, you have to have, they'll sec check you personally or what's called like a tailor made, which is just made for you basically um, to double check that you're, you know, a team player, I guess. And how long did it take you to get through that vetting process in order to be able to get to where you were? Um, so the EPF is the first thing you do in the Sea Org, and that's usually uh, between two weeks and like two months, I believe, is the longest they want you on it. Otherwise, they'll kind of route you out um, or offboard you is, is what it's called. They try to use like a lot of sailing terms. And then, um, so I finished the EPF, and then I went straight from my EPF to my CMO EPF, which is Commodore's Messenger Organization Estates Project Force. Um, and did that, which basically consists of um, reading messenger orders. There's a lot of training routines that you have to do to a pass by a senior messenger. Um, and then when you get into the CMO, you basically start out as a messenger in training. Um, and then there, then you become an actual verified messenger, and then you be either become a watch messenger, which um, nobody after the mid 80s was technically able to achieve because they weren't on watch with LRH. So there was only people like Janice and Terry and Bob and you know a bunch of people that were at the ranch and, and stuff like that. Um, were the original watch messengers. So subsequently, they're the ones that approved most of the CSWs, which is completed staff work. So those were all done for um, each messenger. Like before you could basically, you, you go through your training routines, you go through all the um, policies and everything, and then you have to have all the stuff sent up lines and, um, then you get approved or you don't. And if you get approved, that's great. If you don't, sometimes they send stuff back like, here's what we want. We want to check out this area and auditing or whatever, or we want you to get up to a certain case level or, you know, they might have certain uh, prerequisites and then you'll either get busted down to a lower org or you can fix them then and then it'll be resubmitted and um, then you get into the org. So I'm assuming that as CMO, obviously you went on specific missions. Well, there's a in the CMO, what's different between it and a bun and most other orgs is they don't have a tech division where they they their product isn't auditing or anything like that or recruitment like for or like um, reg registration like they don't take in money. So as a observation and execution arm, their technical divisions are action and ops bureau, observations. And observations bureau basically deals in um, invest, evals. Um, basically, they investigate areas that have stats down. They monitor, you know, all that kind of basic stuff. They're basically like a, a human resources on steroids <laughs> is kind of what it is. Um, and add a little 1984 and you you pretty much have 
um, Ops Bureau. You know, that's they look for outpoints. Like the data series says, one outpoint is enough. You know, and then you ch you pull that string, and you pull it back and find find the why, and that's pretty much all they do. So an action bureau is how they get that done, basically. So um, CMO is set up to basically be that. It has the bare bones of an org. Otherwise, it is an observation bureau, an action bureau, and then it has a personnel bureau, which is HCO, to, that's supposed to have a missionary unit of qualified missionaries. You're supposed to have a fully complemented missionary unit. Um, and if you don't, the policy says that you're able, like if we're doing a mission into the flag service org, um, division four, we are allowed to go into that division and pull somebody out of it to do the mission and take the personnel from that org to supply a part of the mission if need be. And then they basically, once that person is on mission, they're empowered, they have CMO behind them. So they have actually, you know, the whole org is basically, nobody messes with a missionary because it's fired from a higher up org. Because even we, as the CMO continental unit, we had an international above us, CMO int. So like when a CMO int mission came to our area, we were all in conditions because we got bypassed. So it was, you had to have basically a missionary unit, but that we never really did. So everybody went on mission. <laughs> it was pretty much you manned people on missions all the time. So how does the, the management, if they even do it, how do they justify all the bypassing and the danger conditions? They don't, what do you mean? How do they justify my honesty? Well, because... When you get bypassed, don't you get put into a lower condition? Wouldn't that be something that isn't supposed to happen? If you're bypassed, you're in danger. Yeah. So and you apply the formula. That's really the change okay. your operating basis. You know, that's <laughs> like you, it's, and then there's a Dur-INR for inspections and reports or a master at arms, and they will come follow up on it. But, um, you're not like assigned, like somebody doesn't say you're in danger. Like as soon as a mission steps into your area, everybody's in danger. Like most of the time you're all, like most everybody's in liability or, or lower, or, you know, once you find the why, if it's like a situation handling mission, it's much different than like an observation mission or, or other things of that nature. If you're there to like, you found a why of why the stats are crashing or, or whatnot, you go in, you remove people from post, you take over the area, and then you train new people and get them ha basically mini hatted and then get them established on post and leave the area as fast as possible because otherwise you never get to leave. <laughs> if you can't train people, you basically are there. So, How often when people were supposed to be mini hatted, how often did it occur that there weren't either A, enough people, or B, there were no people to be able to replace said personnel? Um, yeah, that's kind of not really a consideration with the Sea Org, is you're expected to make it go right no matter what. So if you're, if you're tasked with that job, then you're expected to do that job and handle that area. And that's just what you do <laughs> if you know what's good for you. I guess, um, I guess the but, question is in that type of situation, what would be done to make it go right? Um, everything, like anything to get the statistics up and get the area producing as it's supposed to be producing. Um, as far as the mission area, you have a, a specific set of primary targets major targets and mission purpose that you have to accomplish and you have to um, basically testify and show proof that they happened. So really as a mission, you're following your orders, collecting data to prove that you did what you did and submitting to get the hell out of there. <laughs> That's kind of what, um, otherwise you become part of, if, if it can't operate without you there and they need it to be, operating well then you're never leaving 
that's what they call a garrison mission. <laughs> that means so you, you could just be indefinitely never. stuck there if stuff doesn't work out. Absolutely. Um, and that's, that's the truth with like um, quite a few of the people that like there's certain jobs within the Sea Org and within um, the different orgs in there that there's just people are irreplaceable. You can't even send them on mission. Like they're untouchable people. Like you're, you just let them do their thing and make their money, and and that's what you do. <laughs> like the L's, um, the L's auditing, any of those auditing or any class twelve auditors or anything like that. You don't like. There's if you try to man them on a mission, you'll get declared. Like it's not because you're screwing with their money line. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So. But or you're screwing with their, you know, right to practice their religious belief in the best way they know how, I guess. Let's talk about uh, if you if you still remember any of it, your first ever CMO mission or whatever. How did that go? Like, what, what was it? How did it happen? What was the process? My first mission? Huh. That's interesting. What would was I remember like the missions I remember the most, like being in a CMO unit. So my job was in HCO, I was the COPE officer. And so basically that's the division head right next to the HCO chief. So we were like executives in HCO division one. And my primary purpose was to cope with everything that's a problem. And while the HCO chief, their primary purpose is to recruit new people, you know, handle any internal ethics things and make sure communication flows throughout the org. Um, and I handle and put out fires. That's kind of my job. And the biggest fire in a CMO unit was manning missions and having a missionary unit and having missionaries ready to go. So I got manned on quite a few missions usually last minute, like middle of the night, you know, sometimes Thursday before two kind of thing. Um, and a lot of the missions are like, okay, go into uh, flag service or division two, talk to um, Jaime and see what, you know, like it's an observation. Like you're seeing if he did the poster and that's basically for the new year's event in four months. And, because there's been problems, blah, blah, blah. So you go into an area and do that. And then some missions you can be done with like in four or five hours. Other missions you have specific, um, like one mission I did was into uh, the dry docking of the Diana, which is one of the boats that they originally had as part of the Sea Org. And it was, I don't, it was like the, my first, so here's, a, it was a first confidential CMO int mission from so all the other ones are just local base stuff. And it's all, you, you know, you don't have anything, you don't get a piece of paper with a bunch of black lines or anything like that. So it was my first CMO int mission and it was like only int cleared people could read it or know anything about it. And I, I briefed, I got prepped, briefed and fired on the mission and my targets were to see the viability of rehabilitating this ship. And so I didn't know what the heck, because it was like super like confidential. And it turned out to be like eight miles north of our base. <laughs> and nobody knew it was there because it was in terrible shape. It was completely rotted. It had been left. Um, I guess at one point it was going to be sold. And then... Um, they realized that they couldn't sell it because it was kind of part of the whole history of, you know, what they're claiming and like their whole history that they portray for L. Ron Hubbard. So for them to have had it and let it go and let it go to waste doesn't seem very, you know, uber religious of them. So it was basically on what it would cost to retrofit and um, the viability of doing it. And of course it wasn't worth it because the thing was like, it basically needed to be completely redone, but it was all based on the sentimental history or the really the public relations of it more than anything. I don't think DM or anybody at Ant really gave a shit about it 
but I think the PR, the pub, you know, the public relations um, would have been a flap or it would have been kind of a potential like, oh, they just trash their old boat. They don't, they're just fake. So I think that was one of the first ones. Um, the big missions that are done usually are like sit handling. Like they're missions that are like, there's a situation um, per the data series. They found the why, they did a complete eval. And there's off of the eval, you write a situation handling mission, how to handle the area. And by having a mission purpose would be like, you know, the stats have crashed in the technical division and the gross income went from 100,000 or a um, million dollars a week to 100,000 a week. And here's the why. This person is completely destroying the area. Or, and it's like somebody's playing bongos and keeping everybody up all night or whatever. Um, so you go in and you RPF somebody. You you know get the whole org there. You take over the area. You put a new person on post. Give them lots of ethics presence. Um, and then you leave the area. And it all should go back to normal. And then... That's the, and then they eventually, after your mission, they do an eval of the mission and see how it went. If the area is still doing well, you get a you know a good review, and if not, then you can kind of get in trouble. <laughs> when you guys found the supposed why, were there ever whys? I mean, I, yeah, I guess I guess you call them a wrong why. How often did wrong whys? come across in these in these situations um well so when i was in cmo in clearwater florida we were responsible basically for the flag service org's gross income and we were at a million a week or right almost there it was like so close and um it was a huge push from INT, the international management, to get this goal, you know. So every, and this was the whole push in the Sea Org is like, if you 5.4x the statistics, you'll get as big as LRH made St. Hill, and the place will boom, and everybody will be clear, and, you know, it'll be great. Um, so everybody works their ass off to get all this stuff done. Um, so it was a huge push for us. So we were like all over division two, which is the registrar's office all over the tech and qual divisions. Um, so we were doing like investigations. Um, we were doing ob observation missions. We were doing everything like daily. The CMO was all over there and we still couldn't get it. The G the gross income up to the right, to the goal or the target. A lot of things, one thing that they talk about in, I don't, may, I, it's all of Sea Org, but mostly like the upper echelons is uh, what they give you is what's called a time machine, which sounds weird, but um, it's basically a target. Like you'll get, um, we used to have a system called the Merck system, and it was like an email system, but it was like a telex, but electronic telex. Um, and you would get these, messages from upper management and they would come with a like seven day time machine and that meant in seven days you had to have whatever they just told you done and handled and so it, it's kind of like you get this push from in saying okay we need to figure out why the stats have crashed in this da, 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 da. we need to get these missions manned and you're doing everything but the gross income doesn't come up and then a mission shows up from int and they would land right in the CO commanding officer's office of the CMO, which at the time was Tom DeVock. Um, and that's when you know, like, it's a big deal because you're doing missions and you can't stop everything you're doing, but a mission shows up and now you guys are writing your overts and withholds. You're all going through ethics conditions and there's people, they're trying to find the why of like, why can't we find the why? <laughs> Because that's what CMO8 does. Um, so that's kind of a, I guess, a, a sort of an answer to your question. <laughs> How often have you guys had like repeat missions where you're like, all right, we tried this, this didn't work, 
go back to it, do it again. Yeah, you know, some areas, like, that's what, like, they don't really go back to the same, they just keep going up. And they take off heads up, and the rank and file falls in line, and everybody gets RPF kind of thing. Um, that's how they solve it. They don't really, I don't know, obs, like the observation bureau is pretty, like they follow the data series. And as long as it makes sense, you know, per the data series, then the eval gets done and it, the area basically gets handled, <laughs> you know, and it, it's kind of, or the interest changes and then it kind of goes off of it and goes somewhere else. And, you know, it, it's, it's kind of always the push of like, you're always supposed to be doing the right thing at the right time, even when somebody's not looking at you or when they're checking on you, everybody's supposed to be, do it because we're all you know it's the purpose it's pushed it's all still pushed even in the higher um echelons but the the i think the responsibility is what um becomes more of a weight and that's where you get a lot of the intensity and that's where you get a lot of the um like real toxicity i guess when did you when did you leave cmo again um God, when was that? it was like right around like 89 90 um because so they were manning up int quite a bit and when we got looked at like everybody in cmo is pretty much the most qualified people on a base like whether whether you're in la or wherever you are um so when a higher up org once personnel they usually like those missions go through cmo too so you're doing personnel missions and then you get looked at as well for positions and all that kind of thing so um they kept trying to man up um what they called at the time lrh archives because even in the cmo <laughs> Um, we had no idea that it was called the Church of Spiritual Technology. We only knew it as LRH Archives. And for the most part, there was an office down in L.A. Um, and that was pretty much where we all thought it was. I want to go back to, like, put yourself in the headspace of being in CMO today in today's Scientology <laughs> mess. Okay. How would... I kind of, that's... Yeah, it's hard. I'm always in that mindset, unfortunately. Um, how would you, as say you were still a Scientologist, how would you, as a member of CMO, be able to find a why for something like Scientology's poor attendance or, or low org statistics in, in the day where they have such a horrible PR, uh, PR reputation and stigma? Like in a, the day and age of today? Yeah. So let's say like, you were CMO today. Um, well, I think it's that cognitive dissonance, um, honestly. It's that the way they did it when I was in and was that everybody else was doing amazing. And you guys were the ones that were screwing up. You know, so it was kind of like when you, unless you actually went to other bases and were able to see it firsthand or, or orgs or um, you didn't really, you just thought you guys had to do better. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just there. Everybody else was booming. So there's a thing we all had a, a game, like every org and every echelon had a thing called the uh, the birthday game. Yep. And it was so it was every year for until LRH's birthday. But you, you were all you all played against each other. So it was kind of like everybody else was killing it and you guys sucked ass. You know, even in the CMOs. Um, when I got the CST, I, I went to um PAC a lot, I went to Ant a lot, um, and I was able to see those CMO units. And like CMO Gold was like two people. <laughs> you know, I mean it was kind of it was like I don't know. It was just funny, you know, and 
so you thought at the time we thought everybody was just like CMO Clearwater, you know, like had a pretty good staff and, you know, maybe 18, 20 people kind of thing. Um, and then we were at flag. So it was like, you know, there was always people, there's thousands of staff and there was a lot of people. Um, and when you're up at Int, it's the same. Like you're all, you're surrounded by all these people like golds there and, you know, some, you know, um, bridge used to be there but there was enough people where it just seemed right well if this if there's this many people here all the missions must be booming all the other ones that's why we keep building stuff that's why we keep coming up with things and you know like when we built the hollywood guarantee building um it was kind of that sign of the little or org down the road was you know wasn't an ideal org yet like that whole idea hadn't even come up yet <laughs> like that that was something made up like he had to find that somewhere <laughs> you know oh it was behind the filing cabinet nobody saw that look elrich wrote it by hand um i do remember one thing the first um thing i remember about the cmo was when i got in i was already uh, in the missionary unit while I was doing my EPF. So I was doing missions. I was in the um, missionary unit and I talked to this, this one of the ladies was a port captain, which is like the, the PR division six uh, head of division six. Um, and she was like, Oh, what, what did you bring with you to the Sea Org? And I was like, Oh, I brought my duffel bag and I brought, you know, my LRH letters and that he signed and everything. And, and she's like, oh, yeah, no, SO number one does that. And I was like, what? She's like, yeah, Sea Org number one does that. They sign, they read all his stuff. He's too busy. He's totally too, like, he's writing, you know, volumes and that fill up rooms of stuff. He can't answer everybody. And so he has a whole group of people that answer all his stuff and sign his name. And I was like, oh, like, I grew up thinking he read everything and wrote it back um and that's what it said at the local missions and orgs it was like hey i will write back you know and they even at that level they were even like he writes all this stuff and he responds to everybody <laughs> you know so it's kind of like that's how you do it right yeah as they... at every level and and in the missions it's more like it's like that cool kids click Right. It's like that um, where you come into something that like what let's say your ruin is um, money. Every time you come into money, you just blow it away and, you know, you're rich biatch, kind of thing. And then it's gone and you have no any kind of longevity or anything like that. Um, you. I'm trying to think what, where I was going with that. Um, I totally lost my train of thought on that. Um, yeah, heck, I don't know. Um, I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> good. Um, is there anything in previous podcasts that you've done with other people or or even not in any podcasts that you may have either a not brought up that you would like to talk about or things that you may have brought up that you didn't feel like you elaborated enough on is there anything you want to talk about here that that you may not have covered it well enough um i think one of the things that i don't hear about a lot is the degrees of social acceptance and social behavior like I, you learn all this stuff like everybody's right now the big hot topics are like narcissists and empaths right like that's what kind of everybody's and sort of everybody sort of grew up in those stereotypical kind of ways um and i think like as you if you get out and you were in a good majority of your life not like if you like my grandfather and took a few courses in you know the south lake tahoe mission 
Um, my dad got in heavy. My aunt and uncle got in super heavy, got into the OT levels. Um, so you get, if you're raised and exposed to it and you get out, or even those people that have been in it and all their networks in it for 20, 30 years, and you get out, you start, there's a level of, I, I don't know, cognitive dissonance is maybe a good buzzword, um, that you submit yourself to. And, and with Scientology, you're more being realistic and like, okay, we only have the way and it's us and we have to do, you know, make ourselves better. Um, you, you, nobody talks about the, like the levels of, oh crap moments. Like you use words that you learned all your life in the technical dictionary and you find out they're not even words, you know, and you find out they're not even like people, like what does that mean like, like telling oh, somebody about surfax or something right right or like aberration kind of or it's like known differently and and you're like what do you mean it's not no that that's a bad that's downtown or people are like what does that mean and you're like well no i meant like and then you're like socially awkward where you end up relating to people that are have been abused like by alcoholics or um things like that who have like toxic empathy you know, because you're like this kind of a religious person who grew up very with a lot of integrity and, and morals and ethics. And then you're exposed to this socially world where you're supposed to agree to things that aren't right. And if you say something, you become the bad person. And learning that social, you know, that you didn't learn in the Sea Org, you, you wrote KRs on people. Like you wrote things that shouldn't be reports. You know, I saw blah, 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 Tony down the street, and he looked suspicious. That just shouldn't be. Like, and you write a report. <clears throat> and the MA go checks it out. You know, so when you translate that to social environments after you get out, it's, I don't know that you can ever, it's more of like, it's trauma response, but in a weird way where you were, like, probably the most present, like, all the mental health is saying, like, Oh, you got to be present and be in the now. It's like, that's all I've ever known my whole life is to be right here, right now. That's all I've ever been. Like, I don't live in the past. I don't dream about the future. I stay right in the present, which is not like, but that's my, tr it's that weird toxic empathy. It's like, you learn to be that, but that's my trauma. Yeah, it's, it's. it's be, so it's nobody talks about that crap. Yeah, it's good to be in the <laughs> present, but there's gonna there's got to be times where you need where you or think about the future. But it seems that Scientology takes it to such an extent that you're supposed to be in present time. At least from my perspective, you're supposed to be in present time all the time. So like, right? It does. It's yeah, not. I, it doesn't seem healthy. Yeah. Well, I don't know that it's. I don't. Yeah, I guess not. Um, I don't know how else you would be, though. Like, I even find myself, when I explain, like, I feel spiritual. Um, and I explain to my, even my kids, like, you you are a spirit. I explain it just like Scientology. It's, like, weird. But I I don't know how else to relate to that. You know, it's um, it's it's a strange thing. So it's... I am not, I don't, it's weird having to deny things that, like, do I have to deny everything and then just completely start new? Or, you know, so I don't think that part is, and I think that that creates a lot of divide in the X community. Um, it creates a lot of unhealed, very raw people. Um, and I don't think that's talked about. Um, and Because I think it's um, one side is sort of supporting the other in some factions, like where you get, you know, it's like any, what are those funnel, the funnel thing where it's like everything goes into one, right? So that's kind of how Scientology is set up. It's, it's like everything's, it's like how Grant Cardone and everybody sets up their, they get that basic business technology that's basically based out of the art of war and big league sales. And, that's how they kind of market it is, is, you know, 
so as exes, we don't talk about a lot of the, I don't know, the struggles. Every, everything's like with Mike Rinder and, you know, Aaron and everything is like copacetic and great. And I don't know. Like, there's a lot of trauma. Like, that's what it's weird to say. Yeah, if you ask me how I'm doing, that's my kryptonite. But you know what my superpower is? I'm fine. So, um, but I don't think a lot of us are fine. I think that's, I think that's a, the, it's hard to translate the way we were raised and we're in it to the way society is and the way it's changing. So I think, and you have to just close your eyes. And I, that's what I, I, I don't know. It's hard to just let things, you know, I'm more important. It's like, I really like the purpose idea and the group concept. Um, and I feel like every time it's just all about the individual, it's selfish and it shouldn't, you know, if I eat, we eat is the kind of, should be the concept, but in this personalized society, it's harder to um, know how to act and interact. And I don't think that's discussed. I don't think the struggles of it, you know, and from top to bottom, like from the Leah's and Mike's and this and that down to the people that have nothing that are living in their cars or, you know, that kind of thing that had the similar experiences. So it's a little microchasm, but um, it's, it's almost like, to the people that are in it making money on both sides want the status quo and you don't want to hear the fringes. So I don't think that's talked about very much. That's something I, I kind of would like to do with the channel is, is be able to get, when I get X member stories, I actually, I would like to be able to, to understand how their time in has affected who they are as a person today and how it's affected their life afterwards. Um, I would say this is the, this is the conundrum for me is I don't do sales because I know I could sell stuff to people and I could, I could sell you poop. Like I could. And, um, but I would slowly die inside you'd, if I you'd, care. You'd feel right? scummy for doing it. Right. Um, so, yeah, I don't think, you know, that's, uh, I think it's, yeah, <laughs> it's hard to say, but at the same time, that's how you, to not care and be part of what everybody wants to be is exactly what Scientology kind of preach. It's the ultimate me religion. It's the ultimate, the, at the end of, of it all on the tech side is no matter where you went, there you are, <laughs> you know, like done. The true product of Scientology and what an OT is, is a Sea Org member. That's, that's what they make. It's like little narcissistic sociopaths that are able to um, be right there in the present, have nothing affect them, get their product, get what they want, no matter what, because what their purpose is justified and higher in purpose than anything they other person has going on. So it's the ultimate, that's what kind of where we are in society is like you're at the grocery store and people are like, if there's three th sticks of butter left and there's five people walking towards it, I guarantee you it's going to be a, a fisticuffs, right? <laughs> like it's because it's crazy. And it's just crazy the way the world is. Nobody thinks of sharing or, you know, it's it's really, it, it's scary. A lot of the parallels. Um, the other thing I'd say as a tidbit is, do you ever watch Ancient Aliens? I think I've watched a little bit of it, like maybe one episode, but I haven't really touched it since. So there's some weird concepts that are kind of strewn through it that are completely parallel with what Scientology has said and you know all this and I, I've always been wondering like if they'll come up with kind of that twist of like have you lived before this life and all that kind of stuff of like because that's what you know millions of years if people have been it kind of speaks to their whole 
idea of what the religion is. So um, it's just kind of an interesting, it's how, how do you, they're going to continue on forever. Like as long as there's money and as long as they keep having buildings and real estate, there's going to be an entity there. So there's going to be a counter entity as long as there's an entity there. <laughs> so kind of reminds me of the know, cycle of is, action, I believe. Right. Yeah. A little bit, but um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, um, I don't know. It's sort of an interesting, if you look, even if you look at the data series, <laughs> which I think this is what this whole idea was about. Um, there's all these out points all over the place. When you look at the whole thing from an, like from an outside perspective or like as a timeline. Right. And, so there's all these strings to pull and you start pulling them like i've naturally done this through my because i don't know you have to be true to who you are right <laughs> so um even in the x community you start pulling strings and you start talking and, and everybody knows the lingo when you talk about you know kind of thing um but it there's a lot of out points so it's sort of interesting even with the um, Rathbun, Rinder, like you go back and you see how I went to a couple of the meetups when they had the indie parties um, because I figured one, I'd know a lot of people there. And two, if any of my family got out, I, I figured they'd go to indie. And if, you know, you're okay with the indies, then they might talk to you. <laughs> was kind of the plan. So um, that's when I held out hope that I would reconnect with family and that's that's what's weird that's the other thing about being out is the importance that family is like to society in general like they can be family can be complete douchebags to each other but they'll still back them up over another person because they're not family and when you don't have that connection it's weird you're almost like a weird pariah in society because you know during the holidays and stuff you don't have you know oh we're, we're oh i hate everything oh it's terrible oh we're picking menus it's like what <laughs> and then all of a sudden they're all together and you're like sitting by yourself and you're like oh i get it like it's strange how family is it's it's really an interesting where in the sea org it was much different you know it was like a whole so there was yeah it's interesting what um there's lots to talk about, I think, about in this topic. So, so it's it seems like you're saying that the the regular world in stuff in situations like that is very, I'm going to use Scientology lingo, second dynamic oriented, whereas Scientology is all about the third dynamic. More, as, well, when they're in the Sea Org. Well, I would say more like third and fourth if you're going to do it. Like, um, I think society is more like first dynamic oriented. That's kind of what the problem is um third dynamic would be more like friends and family um and then fourth is like the world right um yeah i don't <laughs> it's funny dynamics i haven't thought of the dynamics in a long time uh, <laughs> but no i get it um no, society is very, like, they're very individual. Like, it's all about me. And then even if they fight with their family in front of you, they'll still fight with, both fight with you. And they're, it's really an, an odd thing. It's not about, like, what I've noticed that's missing is integrity. Just personal integrity. I think that's something that's pushed in Scientology a lot. They have a policy on it. Um, and I think that's, like missing in the world today like just having those basic like or fo38 <laughs> like basic etiquette <laughs> like if somebody's walking through a door holding something you don't just walk in the door and let it slam you hold the door open for the person you know like those kind of things so um i guess those would be pluses <laughs> if we're talking scientology <laughs> i mean i I'm, I'm going to be honest, like I came into this interview pretty ill-equipped. Um, yeah, what got you interested in all of this? So it actually all started with Leah's show. Right, and you started reading the data series, right? 
Yeah, the the most recent series on this channel is the data series. I just finished, I just put up video number 28 today, and we and I finished the proper format and correct action policy. Okay. So I actually learned about like the, the observe, evaluate uh, the five points in the summary. I remember like one of them, the fourth one was supervise. The fifth one was, I think, review. Okay. Right. So, yeah, I, so it, the way I guess, so background with that is like the way that's executed in like practicum is the ops bureau is consisted of an ops chief. Right. And then there's, um, Different er like different areas of the base will have people that are there, like basically observation person, and they kind of keep track. They get all the statistics every week. They monitor kind of all the personnel moves. They just kind of monitor the areas and look for any out points or anything like that. And so they use all like the way the data series um, in like an in a um, ops bureau each staff member will have like a hatting pack and it'll have a bunch of different policies um that you need to read and understand and demonstrate you have knowledge of for that specific job and part of hco is to make sure that they have all the hatting packs and everything you know in order to get their jobs done you like establish them on post and part of getting on post is you have to go through eth or your ethics conditions of non-existence and then up from there. So it's kind of, it's interesting how um, some people had their, their C org where they were in tech, like all the tech divisions or auditors and that kind of thing, or um, case supervisors or even tech pages. Um, and then some people were more administration, did more of like the management from the beginning. And that's where like CMO did that. Even in each org, each HCO um, had to be more qualified because they need to know how to basically run all the, you know, keep all the policy in and all the ethics in, which basically keeps the C org members in line, I guess. So it's kind of fascinating the, the way coming up with, like from your point of view, I mean, they use it in stealth with dentists, chiropractors, you know, like all this technology, like what are your thoughts on after reading the data series and like, what is it just a bunch of hogwash or is it a bunch of, is it just like psychobabble? Or? Considering the fact that one that I'm not finished with it yet, um, every time I put up a video, the reading is completely raw reaction of not having read it at all. So, right. but I, 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 do believe that there are some concepts that he's going to have some good concepts in there, some, some practical concepts. I don't believe everything is, is good. Is the one thing I've really had an issue with is the fact that the why is always something you can control. Right. So when like in, like I asked earlier about the whole problem with PR that Scientology has in the stigma, that's not a why in any singular division. Right. But it can well, still yeah, lead to problems. And I think at one point, it's kind of like people ask if like David Miscavige was like a true, is he a true believer or not? It's kind of like at, at one, I think it has to go hand in hand. You have to like give up and give in more, like buy in more. And at one point you either have to be like, I'm all in. And I, I like that you're, it's like fanatical, you know, like you're, you'll go from a fan to being fanatical. You can't <laughs> and, have any, any, what is it? No bunch of namby pamby panty waist dilettantes have ever accomplished anything. Right. Well, and that's, I think that probably comes from more of his like um, hypnosis and all that, that kind of stuff. And and big league sales to a bunch, you know, you get somebody saying yes, and then it's hard for them to say no. Wouldn't you agree? Right. <laughs> so now you're saying yes, and I get, like, those are the little subtle things that it's like. I remember um, when I was a kid, they used to have at all the missions, they'd have an introductory seminar, they, and you give out cards 
any to everybody and be like at seven o'clock there's an introductory seminar da, da, da. and then the there'd be the tech person he'd get up on the little pew and he'd do a little fun thing and he'd like have a whole all audience and be like hey you know we're talking about um the different kinds of the mind that's all scientology does is there's the analytical mind the reactive mind and he's like and we have power to control it so like he's like everybody you know picture a cat you know picture a cat in your mind um and then he'd just do a basic little session with him. Did you, did you get it? Okay, you got it? Okay. You know, picture it to yellow or whatever and make another picture of that. Okay, now throw them away. And then everybody kind of laugh and, you know, basics, like stuff that's just group stuff that you do in groups, you know. Um, and then they try to sell an introductory course to anybody who's interested or do an uh, Oxford capacity analysis little test. Um, and that's kind of how they get them in the door with these little, like, get them saying yes, get them excited or like, whoa, I feel better a little bit about my problems. Maybe there is hope, you know, you, you have the answer. Like, that's how those grassroots things, that's kind of what got Scientology off the ground when it came out. And then for the sustainability, it's not like the Mormons that has, you know, the whole what like sainthood and that kind of like where joseph smith was supposed to like oh i've ascended to the rank of this now and you're like um scientology tried to go with the science route and the science of the mind and a philosophy right and that's well it's whatever would sell like if you know you can't be validated as a, as a psychology or as or as that you're gonna have to be and at the time you would be looked at as a whack thing you need that legitimacy so you have either had to be a religion or be validated by the american like psychiatric association so yeah it's kind of uh crazy for him to come up with have you read um mission earth it's a decology <laughs> so it's like a million words but um i think it's 10 volumes it's an interesting parallel to what happened with Scientology and kind of its view. It's like a futuristic novel. Um, it was sold through ASI. But, um, yeah, it was written. Oh, the other thing I was going to say about the data series is if you look at the bottom of most of those policies, there's a bunch of initials. And a lot of people wrote stuff for hubbard and then um he would approve it so not all of it was written by him what is that it's it's the data series so i'm just oh, right, scrolling right. through to try to find some initials assisted by avu verification officer yeah, author, authorization verification unit. Um, and that could be anybody. Yeah, so far a lot of when these. When he says Owen Hubbard founder, that's him. He wrote it. Yeah. There's no assisted by. Yeah, I've noticed that on a few of them, assisted by like the compilations unit or. Right. And sometimes there'll be, there'll be initials and all that. And internally, he, I mean, he did, it was an amazing compiler of information. Yeah. Like, amazing. I've, I've got the, the, the red, green, and most of the, the R and D series downstairs in my basement. <laughs> There's, um, Oods, which is orders of the day. There's flag orders. There's yep. all, there's so many other orders that are like, so you have to kind of, when you're in it, you have to know what trumps what. You got it. You got your yeah, CBOs. See, that's your Saint Hill. That's why the like the data series, the um, Saint Hill Special Briefing Course. Um, those courses were all like when he was really. I think there was a time when, it's kind of like DM where he really believed, and then he got into the whole money thing and and all the extra, and had people help him like David Mayo and and then had to blame them and find them as the why and all that kind of stuff so 
I think after that, it's kind of like the Dread Pirate Roberts. <laughs> it's like it really is. It's like here, I'll hand you off my lucrative scheme. That's where Mission Earth comes in. If you read Mission Earth, um, I'd be interested to hear what you think about it. Yeah, I'm. I'm sure I actually have. A, I think I have maybe three of those upstairs, but it's like seven, nine, and ten. I don't have any of the beginning ones yet, so I'd have to check yeah, some out some used bookstores. Yeah, if you find one, like one through six and seven, for the most part, is I don't know. It was very. It was interesting. It was an interesting read. That's what I would say. Yeah, a lot of the stuff that's older, like from Saint Hill. Is going to be mostly accredited to him. Yeah, I did assisted by admin training lineup sort out in charge. Right. <laughs> now, and a lot of times on the actual policy letter on the top, um, there would there would have been like a routing. Uh, no, those are just HCOPLs, right? Yeah. Yeah. HCOPLs are yeah. Those are. Um, most of those wouldn't be, well, though some of them will have stuff like that. Yeah. Where there's missions and those are all missions. Those are all based. That's all people that go do missions. The in charge is just the in charge of the mission that went and redid or sorted that stuff out. Yep. So that's how, that's how most of those, that's how the data series is applied. That's it. There's, I'm still like, I'm just halfway done with all the pages in the data series. So I still got a shit ton to go before I get the, the a basic idea, at least, of the whole picture. Because I know that as an outsider, I'm not going to be able to get a full picture in my lifetime. Right. Considering I all guess. the written materials. Yeah. But I, Well, it depends. Like, I, that's kind of part of the compartmentalization of it, I think. is um, That's why they keep tech and admin separate is that you don't, you know, they're like, okay, you're going to be in this division running this doing finance. Mm -hmm. You're going to be doing this. And so they keep kind of people, um, and not to say that you don't get bounced around. And when you go from, you know, one org up to another org, you know, I was in HCO in CMO, and then I was in estates at CST. So it was kind of like be a they needed a division head. <laughs> so they were like, okay, you're in the States now do everything with building. And you're like, I was in personnel <laughs> and doing missions. <laughs> like what, you know, that's so musical it's chairs, like, right? but you don't, well, not really. Like it's musical chairs is when you, that's what, so manning missions is, would be a, a fun little topic, but um, that's where you can musical chairs. That's like the, like the pitfalls of, the mission mission doing manning missions or anything is you have to pull people out of orgs put somebody else hold their post while they're on the mission and do all this and that's where you can get like musical chairs um mostly yeah it's weird knowing like all the terminology and then having it applied in real life <laughs> for sure <laughs> so um, well, no, we and got... it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's a trip. It's, it's, um, we, most people in the Sea Org avoided study time because your statistics were way more important than studying. Was study time required or? Yeah. I mean, and that's where, when in missions came in, they would make you go study again and you would have to do all like, but, and then as they'd leave, like it'd stay in for a while and then by the time they came back again, like half the people hadn't been to studying in like months. Oh, geez. So, and who's going to order you to, every once in a while the supervisor would come up and be like, you haven't been to study for, and you're like, sorry. Yeah, and well, you when you go to study, your stats go down, apparently. Well, right. Yeah, because you're not on the lines taking care of everything. That's, you know, there's some positions that were easy and some were flappy. So we have two minutes, 50 seconds that. left. I think this is going to be a good spot to end off. Um, For sure. Next time we'll figure out some uh, questions and then we can like. All well, I would like to cover Manning missions because you did mention that just, just a little bit ago. 
Yeah, let's figure out some a good um, because there's a lot about that of going into like every CMO unit is over an org. And you're able, there's policies that talk about going in and they have to supply a missionaire. So like getting somebody out of an area um, to man, sometimes you have to do it like s sneaky. So we'd wake up like the captain of flag service org in the middle of the night and say, sign this, we're taking this person, you know, and we have them man like all night and then by the next morning be in class a and address the whole org or those kind of things so yeah there was a lot of weird you hold this post hold that post and then people wouldn't and yeah it was crazy so many missions would be interesting all right well we got our next topic uh you and i can email back and forth or text or whatever to try to figure out some good points to cover because I, I am going to have, I'm literally just going to ask for an overview. I'm not going to have any idea of where to start. So, Yeah, well, if you see stuff like anything that I said, like as you're reading the data series, um, if something comes up, then that's kind of a good segue, you know, like to be like, oh, you mentioned this and here's this or how it relates or what you think or, you know, that kind of thing. I have a pretty good recall on it. Um, for the most part, I can remember everything <laughs> I need to. <laughs> but um, yeah, we can, I don't know, we can talk about it and, and see what comes up. Sounds good. All right, we got less than a minute. So I'm just going to end off here by saying thank you, everybody, so much for watching. Thank you to Dylan Gill for coming onto the channel. I really appreciate it. And I hope we can do more podcasts in the future. So thanks. I will talk to everybody later. Like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, do what you got to do, spread those numbers, and let's get those, uh, those stats up in, in affluence. So I took up Mark Headley's little birthday game challenge. So It's a birthday game challenge? Yeah, trying to get past Scientology subscriber it. count. Oh, funny. That's awesome. But All right. Um, I'll talk to everybody later. See you. Bye.